So thank you very much for giving us opportunity to be here today. And if we consider the timeline of events, this past time, half of it is Chitra Ketu's past time. This goes on for several chapters in the Bhagavata. And then we come to Vritrasus. But the way it goes is that the chronology and the textual narration is not always going in the same sequence. That means it is that when this question, when Uttarasur's glorious death happens, at that time the question is asked, how does this happen? So then the backstory can be told. Sometimes uh, the story is not told linearly. Sometimes backflashes are given. So the Bhagavatam, in this particular case, is following an interesting structure. So we have Rutrasu past time, then we have Chitrapitu past time. And that surprise twist, where, say, there is a multi movie part, and there is a villain from the first movie is there, and the villain is fighting, 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 and seems to be a terrible, terrible, terrible person. And just when the villain is about to die, the villain is turned sure to be actually not a bad person, he's a good person. So it's 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 intriguing, and then everybody waits, okay, what is the sequel? What is going to come next? What how did the good person end up on the bad side? Now one of the things that the Bhagavatam is demonstrating consistently is that moral lines are not simply black and white. It's then my voice is a little low. Okay. Prabhu, in one of the devices that you are not using the audio, can you disconnect audio from the Zoom that is un next to your mic? There is a little arrow and it says leave computer audio. If you do that, the Feedback and your no computer is audio. Where is that? Next where to the that? symbol. And that will be interesting. I could do that. Where, where is that? Option? It was visible, Prabhuji, when you pressed in something, right? Yeah. The you go down, time. let me connect audio. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah. And maybe the volume on this device you're speaking, if you can hike it up, it'll help. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. max volume, Prabhuji. Is it on max volume? The... No, but the, the, the device volume is for output. I don't see. Okay. I just, okay, let me speak loudly. Let's, is it better now? Yes, this works. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you. So, if we consider white and black. Okay. The audio is breaking up now. Well, I'm on Wi-Fi. My internet is good. I don't know what I can do about that. I think it's okay, Prabhuji. Please continue. Okay. Continue, Prabhu. Okay. Thank you. You can do one thing. You can bring this. Let us see if this helps. Yes, it's better now. Okay, thank you. Sorry about this. Mm -hmm. So now when we're talking about the logistics of the sorry, not logistics, the ethics of the Bhagavatam. So there is black and white, but there are also many shades of gray in between. And if you see the Bhagavatam begins itself with Parichit Maharaj having done something questionable, questionable for which he has been cursed. But still from that, something glorious comes. So the blurring of the moral lines is right at the beginning in the context of the Bhagavatam. A good person doing a bad thing. A bad person, here the opposite described, a bad person seems to be doing a good thing. Good thing is, the bad person seems to be giving spiritual wisdom to the person who is supposed to be a good person. So we can have shades of gray 
can be in terms of situations. Hmm? That means, okay, in this particular situation, what is the right thing to do? So the situations, what actions are right or wrong in the situation? It could be also in terms of persons hmm? and their character. That means, is this a good person or a bad person? It can go both ways because ultimately, uh, people good. So here we will see good people can do bad things occasionally, and bad people can do good things. So when that happens, now of course this does not mean that there is no such thing as bad or good. Yes, that's definitely there. And there are no such thing as bad people and good people also. There are characters who are villainous. And they are also described in the Bhagavatam at times. But this blurring of moral lines often is a reflection of reality. In real life, few people are completely good or completely bad. Sometimes we, the more we expect a person to be completely good, then when that person doesn't live up to our expectations, we start thinking that the person is completely bad. Say, for example, if our, our conception of people, sometimes I find that, say, if our, our conception of people, our expectation of from people is that they should be completely good. And the more we expect this, if we, this pend, if we consider this a pendulum over here, it is artificially lifted higher and higher and higher and higher. And then it cannot be held at that level for a long time. And then when it comes down, it just swings and goes to the other side. The same people whom we had thought to be completely good, then we start thinking that they are completely bad. That this person is a terrible person. But the point is that everybody is has goodness and badness within them. And especially those who are spiritually minded, those who are emotionally inclined, they are good, but there might be some bad within them. So, now in this case of Rukhurasur, there's a past life story because of which, in one sense, due to no fault of his, or due to a minor fault of his, he was cursed to become a demon. Now, in one sense, the Bhagavatam's whole purpose is to help Rathrasu, uh, help Parishit Maharaj focus his mind on the Lord. And the curse that Rathrasur got, or the Chitraketu got, was actually far worse than what Parishit Maharaj got. Mm -hmm. Parishit Maharaj was cursed to die. You know, dying is a terrible thing. But, uh, okay, at the end of this life, he also knows that he is eternal. So, but Rathrasur, is cursed to behave like a demon. Not only become a demon, but also to behave like a demon. And that is not a comfortable thing at all, especially for a person who is principled, a person who is a person who is uh, concerned about good behavior. So Vratrasur's curse was not just in terms of it was. We compare it with Parikshit's curse. It was far worse because, see, bad things happening to us is difficult enough to hear. But be having to do bad things, that is far worse. So for Parikshit Maharaj, it was bad thing happening. And, but for him, Ritrasar was bad thing um, having to do a bad having to do bad things. So now, what do you mean having to do bad things? Is it that uh, we are we are powerless? Can situations force us to do bad things? Well, that is what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking, in this verse, with Rasur, when he's speaking that we are all like puppets, 
and we are controlled by the lord and prabhupada says akhila ishwara krishna arasabhadya so what does this mean that if we are a puppet every example conveys a particular point so if you focus on the puppets example puppets exam meta metaphor it seems to convey that there is total control with puppeteer and the puppet cannot do anything at all puppet will just move according so is this really true in scripture whenever statements are given the statements themselves may be true they are true because they are scriptural statements at the same time every statement is made in a particular context and unless we understand the context we can we can absolutize a statement we discussed this theme earlier that there are two approaches to scriptural statements and both can both can be problematic so one is to absolutize every scriptural statement this is what it is and there is no reasoning nothing to be done just accept it as it is the other is to relativize it so absolutize i mean this is always true for example shri prabhupada states that it is my standing instruction to all my disciples that if you are disturbed by sex desire you should get married mm-hmm. now we may say this is an absolute statement of shri prabhupada but then there is another letter by shri prabhupada another statement prabhupada makes that you no know, marriage is no solution for sex desire says everybody is tormented by sex desire even up to brahma and, and everybody needs to learn to tolerate so what is the instruction over here there are two opposite instructions and we could say that there are, there are many places uh, prabhupada seems to give instructions that are not only different but also opposite so if we absolutize then the problem is then opposing statements they become extremely difficult to understand and some people when they encounter such statements they start saying it's relative they relativize it and they say that mm, that these have no authority and you know there is a statement for this person this statement for this, this person is all relative so if we relativize we erode the authority so then the problem comes up who decides how to relativize something and relativization can lead to minimization of authority and the erosion of authority thereafter so in between the two of them is to contextualize contextualize means we understand the statement in the context it is true it is true but the literal statement may not be universally true hmm? so it is true but in that context now what is the difference between context and contextualization and relativization contextualization means that we understand that the underlying principle in the statement is true but in the context a particular a particular specific application may not be true so when we contextualize statements what we do is we consider two things there is so the difference relativization is basically almost like rejecting the statement itself but contextualizing statements it involves accepting the universal principle that is there in the statement and once we accept the universal principle thereafter consider consider specific application now universal principle specific application when we think of it in this perspective we could think of it another way 
there are uh, there are three broad steps which you could use in this sometimes this is called as the ladder of abstraction so ladder of abstraction this is a term used in literature abstract means not concrete not specific but abstract can also mean universal so at the bottom of this ladder is specifics at the top of the ladder is universals and on the other side also the top of the ladder is specifics so for example let's consider the bhagavad gita the specific thing that the bhagavad gita teaches is that fight krishna is saying are you going to fight a war now if we take this the if the gita, if we take the gita example it says fight now if we don't consider the universal principle if we apply this to the bhagavad gita then what will happen is if we just take it literally from here to here that will mean that we all should fight and people will say that the gita is a book of violence it is a religious book which rationalizes violence and therefore anyone who follows gita will be a a dangerously violent person but none of the acharyas have actually taken this application now that the kshatriyas can fight kshatriyas should fight in particular times but is that the, is that the essential message of the bhagavad gita vishwanath mm-hmm. thakur baldev vidya bhushan they were all living at times when india was overrun by muslim invaders and they did vishwanath thakur worked a lot for trying to protect Vrindavan or restore Vrindavan after the depredations of Aurangzeb. And yet, in his Gita commentary, he doesn't go about saying that, oh, fight, you know, you should rise against and rise, rise against these uh, barbaric invaders and we should destroy them. And that is, that is the message of the Gita. No. He focuses on the universal principle. What is the, uni- the universal message for the Gita is what? surrender to krishna harmonize with krishna's will and how that surrender will be applied in today's world that will something which we have to see so for us surrender shri prabhupad may explain that it um, that could mean we do we do outreach mahaprabhu has said yuga dharma for this age is kali yuga is the chanting of the holy names it's glorifying the lord and we should try to spread the glories of the lord so the specific application of the gita for today will be not yudhyasva but mamekam sharanam raja karishye vachanam tava so karishye vachanam tava what is mahaprabhu's will that i have got so many so many fruits but i alone can't distribute all of them you please help me in distributing them so when we take specifics fr- from a particular context and we when we relativize them then we don't consider the universal at all so we say that the specifics were there at that time and they don't matter at all today that's relativize but when we absolutize we literally take the specific from there and bring it over here and that doesn't work hmm? so now when we take this specific statement that we are all like puppets hmm? we are all like puppets so what does it mean in its own context now if we absolutize it let, let's start with absolutizing it let's then we'll talk about relativizing it and then we'll contextualize it so if we absolutize the statement are there any problems with absolutizing it well first problem could be that it it denies free will now if it denies free will what is the further problem because of that it that makes scripture itself pointless this is one of the strongest arguments against uh, a complete fatalism scripture tells us do this and don't do this that is not all that scripture says that the analysis there is past times but there are definitely instructions in scripture and baldev vidya bhushan vidya vishwanath of course both of them in their commentaries at various places but the devotion especially in vedan sutra says that if we have no free will that all the scriptures especially the instructive part becomes meaningless if i have no free will 
then if god is if you have been told do this and don't do this but i have no free will so what is the point of the instruction if you absolutize the statement that we are simply like puppets make something worse actually it actually makes god into devil or because it makes god evil now why do i say that why do i say that because it's like suppose i'm just living a normal law abiding life and says some police comes and catches my hand places a gun in my hand and then raises my hand by force it forces me to press the trigger and that shoot someone and then the police arrest me and then they put me in jail and they hang me you committed this crime that would be atrocious you made me do it and now you are blaming me for it so the same would apply to god because god has arranged a system by which bad karma gets results and bad results serious consequences come up so what it would imply is it is god who makes us do bad karma because we have no free will it is god who makes us do bad karma and then he makes us suffer for the bad karma and what would we call such a person if not a devil if the police started doing like this framing innocent people and punishing them you would call them evil so absolutizing such statements that we are merely like puppets that is uh, that is seriously problematic now the other extreme we could go is to relativize relativize means now what how might we relativize this oh this is just a subjective feeling he's about to die and he's he knows he's going to die he's facing overwhelming odds so he's just uh, it's just a sentiment now it could be sentiment but this is not just a statement that occurs once it is i think in the first canto also when narad muni is speaking to yudhishthir maharaj he says that just as a player moves the pieces on a board as a mr prabhupad would use the example of chess and pawns just be like that uh, it is he says that similarly we are all moved ish tantraha we are all controlled by the lord we are moved by the lord so if we relativize what does it mean we are either making it reducing that a person to a sentimental character speaking a falsehood something which is false and we are saying multiple statements are also essentially false so relativization becomes a problem so then what does contextualization mean contextualize it means that we look at statements in their context and does that mean that they are not true now no every statement has a literal aspect and a universal aspect the universal aspect is true the specific aspect may or may not be true because context changes so for example you know prabhupad is giving a say sometimes he gives a lecture in the lecture he is saying tam sritikshya so bharat hmm? so we should all tolerate and he may give an example that the months of summer like may april may are hot mm-hmm. and at that time working in the kitchen on a stove is difficult but we should tolerate now we may say april and may are hot but are they hot all over the world well in the northern hemisphere some parts they are hot but in other parts that is the cold season so what do we mean by this the prabhupada is giving a principle the principle is that we need to tolerate unfavorable situation and continue our duty so we don't reject the statement but what we understand is the statement has a specific import or a specific instructive aspect and a universal applicational aspect also so then what does apply now okay the part on which i part in which i live maybe the cold months are not 
maybe may is a relatively a cold month hmm? okay but that does not mean the principle okay then i have to tolerate cold there not heat but cold so it does not mean that to follow the prabhupad in a cold season i have to create a scorching heat in my room by using lots of electricity and then i tolerate that heat no so contextualize so when we contextualize then we can we can actually both understand scripture better and understand how to apply scripture better so we move up the ladder of abstraction to understand the universal principle and then come down to specific principles so now with this point now let's look at, look at another this is a well known english example in english about how context matters so if somebody makes a statement i never said he stole my money now we may say this is a straight forward statement mm, i never said he stole my money but actually this statement can have six different meanings based on what is emphasized say for example we say i never said he stole my money if i is the emphasis then what means is now somebody is or somebody is telling us can you be a witness for this particular crime can you give testimony is i never said this means maybe someone else did so if the person is speaking and they have i i mean i never said he stole my okay and then if you change it it never becomes the emphasis i never said he stole my that means that you know that person is my friend that person is my relative even if he has done something like that i am not going to rat out that person rat out means that this this is a phrase or a idiom which says that you know somebody has two people have done something wrong and one person turns on the other person and tells or oh, two people have done something which is questionable together but you go against i never said i would never do something like this you know we are friends and we'll stick together i never said i never said he stole my money now said could mean you know maybe i just wanted plausible deniability so maybe i indicated i didn't speak those words i communicated in some other way i didn't speak it verbally i never said that i never said he stole my money it could mean it could be his son stole that money he is not to be blamed he, you caught him you caught the wrong person um so i never said he stole my money if he if he stole that means he had borrowed my money but he is not re- returning it now that's my problem it could mean so many things so i never said he just stole my money he is again stole someone else's money uh, it's not a crime against me it's a crime against someone else someone else's money and then you may say that i never said he stole my money i never said he stole my money that means you know maybe he stole my my faith he stole my reputation he stole my credits for something that i done so he could have stolen something else so now how do we know when we are speaking when somebody emphasizes something by that we understand in their emphasis of tone what is being spoken mm. so giriraj maharaj was uh, told me once that the statement like prabhu passes women are less intelligent now he said i heard all the recordings that we have whether it is prabhu taking lectures or prabhu pad uh, transcribing for his books all the places where i could lay my hands on my prabhu passes women are less intelligent he says i knew prabhu pad i spent a lot of time with him and he said that not to i knew the inflections of prabhupad's tone i know how he would speak when he was in a particular mood 
and he said whenever i heard this statement about less intelligent not once there was there any deprecating tone oh, they are they are fools they are less intelligent no his tone is he said my conclusion after hearing these talks again and again uh, the my conclusion is that when tahupat is saying women are less intelligent he is not speaking this to women to tell them that you are less intelligent you are foolish he is actually speaking this to men that you come forward and take responsibility and that's why sometimes prabhu not sometimes many times prabhu pat puts women and children together as the children need to be protected men need to be protected now that particular statement it can be understood in many different ways and prabhu pat never minimized i mean he did not say that uh, that less intelligent means there should be restriction in service it does not mean necessarily that there should be deprivation so what he meant could be open to discussion so we can't absolutize statement so we can contextualize here by understanding the tone in which it is spoken so there is a statement but the context is the person speaking it and the tone they speak now unfortunately for us when we read written statements the tone is not so easily visible for us and sanskrit is a efficient language no sanskrit avoids punctuation marks too much in english if you want to emphasize something you can put exclamation marks some people put some there's two three exclamation marks to, ex- to express the surprise or some put two three questions well that is just uh, overuse of punctuation but sanskrit is a efficient language it does not rely so much in punctuation so it relies on the intelligence of the audience to understand the point based on context sanskrit even in the past was generally not widely spoken by everyone it was that uh, that there were different languages vernacular languages for people sanskrit was the language of the brahmins of course others also knew it kshatriyas also knew it brahmins kshatriyas and shudras knew vaishyas knew it shudras might also know it a little bit but it was not their normal conversational tone so the why am i saying this sanskrit relies on the intelligence of the audience to understand what is being written and therefore now when in a text see in a conversation for context we can look at tone but in a book if you want to look at context we don't have the tone to look at so there is no tone at all now of course sometimes the tone comes out in the written words also what a what a foolish thing to do what a wonderful thing this is but that verbal audio inflection that is not there so then what do we do we have to look at preceding and succeeding preceding means what comes before and what comes after so this means that sometimes so if, if this is we look at what comes before what comes after so if we look at what comes before and what comes after in this particular past tense so the principle is that sometimes we all may be put in some situations where we just have no options it's like some generally sometimes we have our options this is good this is bad but sometimes our options are only bad and worse so here it's relatively easier to choose but here what do we do so sometimes we just have to accept the situation we are in and as prabhupad would say make the best of a bad bargain so does that mean that there is no choice sivratrasur himself could have kept fighting he is going to accept defeat so what does he mean he is he is going to stop fighting or rather not sorry he doesn't stop it he doesn't exactly stop fighting rather he is instructing indra to not stop fight but in fact he is saying we are all like puppets but in one sense he is telling indra to use his free will 
if indra is like a puppet now indra has given up his weapons and he's saying i will not fight okay he's a puppet he can't fight now but he's telling up rise and fight so the context itself doesn't seem to support the idea that we are literally like puppets so the puppets metaphor is used to convey a particular point that sometimes in particular situations you just have no choice you just have to accept that bad situation and then make the best of a bad part so the puppet often refers to our being propelled into a particular situation a particular setting a particular environment when we are propelled into a particular setting situation we are there what can we do at that we we can resent the situation but that doesn't help you just have to accept that i am in this situation right now so we might be just having a normal healthy life and suddenly we fall sick and it's a, it's a it's a terrible sickness well we just put in that situation or you know we might just visit some country and suddenly a a, a big storm comes over there electricity is cut off and power is goes off uh, sorry and internet goes off transportation shuts down and we just wanted to be there for one day and we have to be there for one month or say to take a contemporary example pandemic now some of us were stuck our loved ones were at one place we are at another place we just couldn't be together so sometimes uh, i know several devotees you know the prabhu was in one country the mata ji was in another country mata ji was expecting and they just couldn't be there together at that time so it's a terrible situation to be in but uh, things often move with by factors beyond our control so the puppet example refers to the point that that we are often propelled into situations beyond our control so when that happens we need to accept that but then after that so after accepting the situation so the puppet example is accept the situation accept that our presence in the situation specifically but then there are other examples given in scripture there are examples for example there are many examples in scripture which talk which emphasize that we have to endeavor that we have to strive you know just like a child falls down on the floor what does a child do child uses the same floor to get up so getting up is actually the an act of free will it's not a puppet so we can say the other example is child falling and getting up that is also an example given in scripture with respect to our ethical activities or for it is said that we take one step towards god he takes a hundred steps towards us but that means we have the free will to take one step so we have in scripture itself examples that you know if you can't do this do this do this do this at least do something 12.8 to 11 It's not also about multiple levels at which one can connect with. If not this, 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 try something. The same thing is there in eighteen sixty-eight to seventy-one. Try to share my message. If you can't share my message, at least study my message. If you can't study my message, at least hear my message. So, one among options. So, if we were simply puppets, um, Krishna would not give such examples. so the puppet metaphor is for accepting the situation that we are in so vitrasur is telling indra that yes you are in the situation now accept it don't resent it accept it and then move forward so vitrasur has himself demonstrating that for just a minor fault he was cursed and he was cursed to become a demon he accepted the situation he acted like a demon till the point of his death when the lord inspired him from within with the dormant devotion that was there that was temporarily covered by the curse that became manifest 
and not is a dormant devotion that devotion has already been the previously cultivated devotion that became activated and then suddenly an extraordinary devotional nature manifested and he now is going to take shelter of the lord i will conclude now with prabhupad's example in the markini bhagavad dharma prabhupad also says nachao nachao prabhu nachao se mate and nacha kashthera putali sata nachao se mate that krishna just like a puppeteer makes a kashthera putul a puppet dance similarly make me dance so here prabhupad is expressing his dependence and surrender to krishna krishna please make me dance and yet <coughs> if you look at shri prabhupad do we think of shri prabhupad the pers- as a person who had no free will the prabhupad was making choices prabhupad was even listening to his disciples his disciples are just at the new york let us pro when prabhupad was attacked in one place in uh, the place where he was saying first by david prabhupad could have chosen to go back to india prabhupad could have chosen to go back to the more prosperous part of new york but prabhupad called michael grand mukund who became lord mukund prabhu and mukund goswami and then he said let's uh and prabhupad moved to another place over there and his disciples said prabhupad let us diverse let us go to san francisco they agreed prabhupad said yes you go there and i will come later so shri prabhupad was a person who was consciously contemplating and making decisions now so there is with respect to prabhupad that prabhupad was not using his intelligence that prabhupad was no was like a, having no free will that is not seen by anyone with whom krishna prabhupad was interacting that prabhupad said that to his disciples when he came to india in 1970 he said that a guru maharaj wanted me to preach in the west and i have done that but now it is my desire to preach in india so you help me in this now there is when we say prabhupad's desire is it independent of the guru's desire that now it is recognizing the broader mission bhagwan sri akur definitely wanted people in the west to take up bhakti but he wanted everybody to take up bhakti and prabhupad felt that india would be the foundation from where bhakti would be sustained and spread all over so he wanted to build that foundation in india so he was not neglecting or rejecting the instruction of his spiritual master he was looking at the universal principle there is a specific instruction and there is a inner purpose the purpose is that the world should have the legacy of krishna bhakti for a long time to come and prabhupad wanted to form that legacy by providing a form a strong foundation so perfect i conclude with this point does it does not mean no free will that is not the meaning it is perfect means we become vehicles or instruments for krishna's will for krishna's will we that means we want to do what krishna wants us to do but when we want become vehicles for krishna's will that does not necessarily mean krishna takes away our free will that means there are certain instructions or situations we accept and we follow but within that we also make decisions so instructions are followed we follow instructions we accept situations mm-hmm. that means that so like prabhupad followed the instruction of his spiritual master that you should preach in the western world and prabhupad accepted the situation that his guru maharaj's mission had Uh, broken apart and he really couldn't do anything to fix it so he was ready to start all alone he didn't resent that he accepted the situation when he came to america he had to start off alone he accepted that so krishna you make me dance make me dance but then while we are doing krishna's wills krishna's will we all have to make decisions and those decisions are made by our free will it is not that we don't have free we use we make those decisions with the right intention with the right intelligence 
so this is our intentions are to serve krishna and for serving krishna we do use our intelligence so okay where should i go should i go here should i go there actually prabhu pada in jhansi and jhansi didn't work out prabhu i chose okay let's uh, let's leave jhansi so this idea of puppet we can see it more as not that there's so much the puppeteer is con- puppeteer controls the puppet as the puppet does what the puppeteer wants and sometimes in situation where nothing there's no option is only one way we accept that way but when there are decisions we make decisions in a way that will fulfill the desire of krishna that will fulfill the broader purpose of krishna and thus bhakti involves both accepting the situation krishna puts us in but also accepting the responsibility to make decisions by which we can move closer to krishna and that is the that is the call that rutrasur is going to make over here like accept the situation that you have to fight against the enemy who is far more powerful than you accept the reality that against this enemy your weapon is not going to work accept with humility the fact that you need a weapon different from that that is the weapon that has been provided by the lord's arrangement through the bones of dadichi don't let your ego come in the way of your purpose and rise and fight this is the way you will win not by using your weapon but using the weapon given by vishnu and for himself he has already accepted the situation that i had to be a demon i did my part as a demon now i surrender now i am going to end my life and we'll see later in this chapter this beautiful prayers that where he says my dear lord i just i just want a long for you ajat paksha vimataram kaga just as a small baby bird longs for the mother to come mother bird to come back this is a calf longs for the cow this is a lover longs for her beloved like that i long to the drukshate i long for you o oh lord so that is his mood and he's got taking the conscious decision is to accept his fate on the battlefield and does attain the lord so i'll summarize what i discussed today the first point i discussed is that if with respect to scriptural statements we need to avoid the statement of the, the extremes of absolutizing relativizing we need to contextualize and if if we absolutize then we face contradictions and we can't resolve them if we relativize we erode the authority so to contextualize what does it mean we discuss the ladder of abstraction we move from the specifics okay what does this mean in that situation we move to the universal principle and then we come back to the specific in our situation how does that principle apply for me today we don't just take that specific and apply it to us this is not the way this is the way so we give some examples of the universal principles being extract ex- Uh, uh, understood and applied, and then I talked about the dangers, so uh, dangers of context, uh, absolutizing and relativizing, and contextualize. We need to contextualize, and how to contextualize was the second part. And the last part was <coughs> the question of if we take the literal statement, the problems with no free will argument. Literally, if we say that we are like puppets, what is the what is the problem with absolutizing the statement that it discuss three problems with that that it it it, it defeats the essential purpose of scripture it um, also ends up making god into the devil and it is not the way the great acharyas have also lived they acted as if they have free will so that was the question so we discussed the point is that not that we have no free will is is our free will becomes an instrument or a vehicle for krishna's will and that means two things that means that we accept situations these instructions or situations are accepted but at the same time it also means that when we have to make decisions we accept the responsibility to make decisions in a way that will fulfill krishna's wills we make decisions 
So the pu- being a puppet is not giving up our free will, but praying for the intelligence and intention to, to be an instrument of Krishna's will and make decisions that will fulfill Krishna's will when it is required. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any one question or comment? Thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for this very, very beautiful class. Yes, Prabhuji, I think that when you take uh, Prabhupada's hope that sometimes we, we should first analyze, take it to the universal platform and then we should check how it is applicable for each and every person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Mataji, it's hard to, difficult to hear you, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji, do you have time for question answer? Yeah, one question. Okay. One question. Okay. I think Sukhaka Krishna Prabhu has raised the question. Prabhuji, you can ask a question. Prabhu, your class is so wonderful, Prabhu. We just wait for your class. So wonderful, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, the biggest, the biggest challenge is this free will. Why did Krishna give? That is the biggest problem. We are not given free will. If we had given as a servant, we would have lived and got back. But that is the biggest stumbling block for everyone, misusing of free will. So how to surrender no. and... A free will is not the problem at all. Ah. Okay. Because if there will be no free will, there will be no possibility for love. And without love, there will be no reciprocation, there will be no joy. So you know, consider that, say, I have talked about this with parents across the world. Many times parents talk about how their children are doing things which are causing them some distress, some pain. Hmm? Mm. But then I ask them, would you prefer if instead of a child, you had a perfectly obedient robot? (laughs) (laughs) Now, nowadays with uh, artificial intelligence increasing, maybe you would like to have a robot to do what we want, but it is in addition to a child, not in replacement of a child. Because mm. there is no joy. Okay, I get my job done, there is some relief. But there is joy only when there is a reciprocation of love. So, if there is only a robot, the idea of nurturing a person, taking care of a person, helping that person to grow up, to become a responsible human being, and taking joy in their success, None of that is possible if that person is doesn't have free will. So, if there is no possibility of love, then there is no no de- no deeper joy. We can say there can be some superficial pleasure. Just get others to do, get something, someone or something to do, whatever we want to do. But there is no joy over there. So that's why. But my question was that my question was we have uh, we know the shastra, we know which is good, anukul and pratikul, but still. We sometimes go to the pratikul knowingly that we are going there doing the wrong thing. So there I'm telling I'm misusing the free will, though it is not to be done. Because of the sense gratification interest is more than the learning uh, what we have learned. Yes. So there also we need to accept our situation. But okay, this is my level of conditioning right now. And in, with this conditioning, uh, sometimes I will I will have lapses. So in bhakti. We sometimes think that bhakti progress, it can be in two ways. We often think that it means an increase in purity. Increase in purity mm-hmm. means that uh, I, bec- I give up all sensual desires, I give up all sensual intelligence. Yes, that is one way, but uh, sometimes a more important thing would be a growth in humility. And humility could mean that, that I repeatedly recognize that these conditionings are so strong that I can't give them immediately. So I have to pray to Krishna more, I have to surrender to Krishna more. Mm. And sometimes I have to go through that phase where I am not what I am expected to be or what I, where I think I am, where I think I should be. So accepting that itself is humility. Sometimes I have seen in many cases that purity is the greatest Stealer mm. of humility. Somebody who is mm. very pure. Suppose they fast nirjal, they they avoid sense gratification, and they become so judgmental and condemning of everybody who is not following similar standards. Yeah, and such people, it's it, no, it's it's 
it's no pleasure being around them they are just a just a pain to be with now krishna says yasman no dvijate loko lokan no dvijate jaya those who are not disturbed by others and those who don't disturb others so such people just go around disturbing others and they are themselves not that they are intentionally disturbing others they are disturbed maybe everybody should be at my level of purity so somebody mm-hmm. is what happened maybe by their past karma maybe in the past they had a subsequent life maybe their past life they practice bhakti so purity is easy for them in this life but then they don't just understand what somebody else is going through in struggling to develop purity so for us if we are going through a phase where we are struggling with uh, development of purity we can see that as an opportunity to develop humility that humility could mean that it can mean we deep with deeper connection with krishna that if no matter what happens whether i can give up sensuality or not i am going to connect with krishna we we recognize our need for krishna but that can also mean greater empathy those who are for those who are struggling hmm? those who have always say for example lived a pure life they may not understand only the struggles that somebody goes through hmm? Hmm. our devotees have now formed a bhakti recovery group that is a group where de- devotees who may suffer from different addictions they are trying to recover from those addictions hmm. and one of the i was talking with several of the devotees and they said that somebody who has not gone through that they just don't understand the struggles that somebody is facing so if we can see our inability to give up sense gratification we're not justifying it and perpetuating it. we make endeavor to give it up but if we're not able to give it up see it as an opportunity to recognize our need for krishna and to see that krishna is preparing us to be more understanding and empathic when we are struggling when we meet somebody who is struggling sometimes we over emphasize purity and then either we can become judgmental or then we become hypocritical hypocritical means the very thing that we are struggling with internally we emphasize that for we on others very aggressively so that now that is also unhealthy so krishna's plan is working even if our attempts for purity are not working hmm. So, thank you very but much. But out of the but probably last one of the of the four uh, defects, imperfect senses, and then uh, getting illusion, and uh, the third one is uh, uh, making mistake. This is not in our control. Once we have imperfect senses, then illusion sits on us, and we do the mistake. But the fourth one, we can stop cheating, no, Prabhu. That is what we are doing the mistake. We are not accepting the error and the fault. So then Krishna will say, "Yes, hey, okay, at least he understood." But the fourth one to cover our faults, if we just somehow cheat, and then inside it has been recorded. So yeah, I think you know cheating is a very strong word. We if we if we do something which is faulty, then uh, that we have to understand that we are conditioned being, and sometimes we will do something wrong. So rather uh, than no, being just mental and saying like that, this is just we. There are some people we should be aware. It's not that we have to tell our faults to everyone. It is some says somebody, some trustworthy senior devotees, friends. That's where Gohiya Makya Ti Prachyati comes in, and then we try to deal with it. It is not that if we have some conditionings, uh, being honest means telling the whole world about it. But it is. It just means that we don't uh, adopt a whole. No, I am just telling a spotlight. One person has one devotee who is uh, initiated. Vibe goes on. His friends comes. They bring drinks. He drinks. He's getting the uh, uh, he's uh, uncontrolled senses, uh, imperfect senses. Then illusion. He makes the mistake of drinking. But when the wife catches, he should not say, "I didn't drink." So that is wrong, Nabu. No? When yeah, he has been wrong. caught red. See, then ultimately everybody has to make a decision of how they want to live. That if they think that they can deny and deceive. others the only person they are deceiving is ultimately themselves yeah See, even if, even if nobody knows even if nobody has the authority to even if nobody has the authority say the wife may not have the authority to do anything to the husband but then our Same. mind our mind always knows the conditioning in the mind is becoming stronger and the person is going to get trapped and that's why it is 
you know, we, I think we may not be caught on mm. our wrongdoings. Mm. Sometimes we might, we might just be too powerful. We might be too cunning. We may not be caught mm. for our wrongdoings, but we will be caught by our wrongdoings. Those wrongdoings themselves. They will become conditionings which will catch us. We will be mm. caught by our wrongdoings. So ultimately, if we think that we can get away, it is we only who will go away. We won't get away. We'll go away. Go away into illusion. So some people have to learn in the school of hard knocks. They have to learn by going through consequences of their bad choices. That's that's the way the world works sometimes.